Hello, good to have you all back to another episode of FinTech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture, our persistent search for humanity and humility in the built environment. And we're broadcasting live again from the opposite ends of the world, me near uh, Munich, um, in fact, in Würzburg, I'm kind of now, but from an American perspective, doesn't make much difference. And then we have you, DeSoto, uh, back in Honolulu, Hawaii. Hi, DeSoto. Hello, everybody. Hello, Martin. And you can hear I'm in an easy breezy room and the trade winds are blowing outside. You can probably hear that in the background. Mm -hmm. And you pointed out I'm wearing, I'm overdressed for the tropics. So that indicates that I'm not there. That's right. So let's go to the first slide and apologize a little bit for, this is actually the volume two of our uh, shows about the vintage village. And we were a little bit under the weather, <laughs> under the clouds of the election night. And this here illustrates from a German perspective, because this is one of our most critical left-wing uh, weekly and, uh, magazines here, the, the Spiegel, the Mirror, that's, has been following the tragedy of the um, who was ruling our, our, our US, our America. And I remember as trying to do a, a kind of a therapeutic self-treatment, I was once doing a show with our founding Uncle Jay that we see at the very top right. And we called it the uh, cynical classicism because Trump, as many of, many of his stupid things, uh, he was trying to mandate a style which we're thinking we should be past that because that while the 20th century might have been about form, the 21st century that we're in should be about perform. Um, so anyways, the next slide is basically explaining a little more because when we were airing, uh, the f there were the first kind of predictions of where the votes are going and, and these snapshots of these color-coded maps here, the one at the very left was the one that I saw when I woke up uh, hours later after I show and I was pretty depressed because it was very, very red. And fortunately that has shifted to more blue and that much blue that we have our hopes back up that we're gonna go back to what uh, at the very bottom right, we were talking to Ron. Do you remember what we were talking about as far as inclusivity, which we see at the bottom right, DeSoto? Well, we were talking about uh, Martin Eichler, who was a builder of homes, mass builder of tract homes and suburban homes in California in the 50s and 60s. And he was a very forward thinking man. He was inclusive in terms of who he would sell his homes to which was at a time of segregation in which people of color were prevented from buying homes in suburbs in many situations. And he also was inclusive in terms of who he hired to work for him. He hired disabled people. He hired men who had just gotten out of jail. So he was a very forward thinker in addition to being an architect who designed homes that we've been looking at and really praising for their attributes from that time period 50 and 60 years ago. Yeah, that we wanna so desperately and urgently reconnect to. And we wanna add that the very bottom right picture when our friend Ron Lindgren was describing that we weren't quite, none of us were quite as, as specific as we should have been because this is an image that um, uh, Eichler had in his office on his wall. And if you would see these two, boys from the other side, you would see that one has a white face and the other one has a black face. So it's a black boy going along with a white boy. And that again was rather uh, shockingly uh, provocative to say in times where racism was, was even more present than we had them increasing, unfortunately, in the last uh, four years. So again, we have our hopes high up there that we're gonna to reconnect to these good times, the best times of America. They were you know, hanging around until, as we said, the 70s, even the late 70s. And just with Jimmy Carter, then uh, you know, we had to let them go and hopefully can pick them up from there again. So what we also wanna do, as we said, we wanna be inclusive again. We don't wanna be nationalist again. We wanna, again, take advantage of the best of all worlds that we represent. And so 
Let's go and uh, pick up from where we had left last time and go to the next slide. And um, what were we talking about, the Soto here? Well, we're back in the Munich Olympic Village, which was constructed for the 1972 Olympics. And we were in an area which originally had been built, as you said, for the female athletes to use as housing. And this, I thought, was remarkably similar to the container housing that we keep talking about using shipping containers in terms of the scale and the size. You said that um, these probably are preformed, precast concrete panels, which were set up in to make these similar houses, these similar size houses. Unfortunately, because of deterioration, they had to be demolished, but because they were historic, they were rebuilt to look very similar to the originals. And you mm -hmm. just got to walk around and look at them and take pictures of them. And you saw that they also, uh, the individual tenants, which now are university students, are allowed to paint them or decorate them the way they want. And it's um, a nice little a nice little village, it really looks like. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And more specifically about deterioration, it was actually that they weren't up to energy code anymore. So right. That's they, right. That's they rebuilt right. them recognizing they had to be insulated better, which once again, we don't need to worry about that too much in Hawaii if we built the right way and allow the natural systems, the trade winds to do the job. Right. The next slide is um, I'm uh, taking advantage of my remote situation being the sort of, um, you know, the ambassador abroad, so to speak. I'm, I'm have arranged with the emerging generation to make the best out of this and then basically being uh, up a little in later in the afternoon so I can be uh, help them early in the morning and to show them around. And I was walking mm -hmm. them through the village and then uh, there was a door open and I basically knocked on that open door and the, 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 the student who lived in there uh, you know, allowed us in. And so you here you see the, the students' comments about how did we get in and, oh, this looks so efficient and so spacious. They're pretty much like a pioneer of what's so prominent these days, which is the tiny house movement, right? They're kind of early yeah. examples for, for tiny houses. So yeah. go to the next slide. Um, they, again, dealing with uh, thermal performance. On the bottom right, you supposedly see the original condition with rolled on shades at the very bottom left you see them improvising more kind of horizontal awning and again you know i've been sharing my experiences with our firm as and the top left an exoskeleton where the structure could shade itself or again frames with rolled on chains so that's certainly something that again with a new leadership a new management of our country and one of biden's utmost goals is to rejoin uh, the, the Paris uh, uh, you know, initiative of climate change combating. So we will increasingly look more into things as we've done in the past four years, uh, luckily and hopefully. So the next slide um, is um, there is a, a piece of new construction within the historically preserved, which is rather interesting. And then next slide is going to show us a glimpse of how that looks like and what's your opinion what's your feeling how do you think this well uh, if i'm if i'm reading this correctly the the court the open space in the foreground is is it, is that original or did they replicate no that is original and again our we talk quite a lot about these kind of pipes you know and here we can actually yeah. see how hollow they are there isn't much in them right yeah yeah so we right. talked about that so that one is original but the building is new so the pavement okay. is old the pipes are old, okay. but the building is new. Okay, okay. Well, you were pointing out that, that in the midst of this very innovative 1972 complex, this new building is not particularly innovative. And that's something that we're going to come back to as we continue this show, the whole concept of carrying on innovations from a time when people were more innovative yeah. to try to keep that updated rather than simply saying, this is what we're going to do now because it's easy and cheap and yeah. that's what everybody expects. And, and, and innovation gets us to the next slide because innovation of this development wasn't just within the built environment, but it was also in the natural environment, what we're seeing here, right? Yes. 
Yeah, and you, I asked you what that big tower was in the background, and this is a big open space park area that's developed as part of the tower. And in the background is the sort of iconic structure, which is a broadcast tower. And that was because it was before satellites, so you needed the big tall towers to broadcast television transmissions. And I also said that there was already one in East Berlin. This is the time of East and West Germany. And in East Berlin, there was this very large iconic tower. So this is the West German version of that. But in this area of um, Parkland, you can see that there is a berm or a artificial hill at the base of that tower in the distance. And this is something that's replicated at the other end of the development. So in both cases, to screen out uh, a large busy street, they built this earthen berm and then planted trees on it. And also from the street, you don't see the whole complex. You see what looks like parkland or a forest or woods. So it's beneficial on both sides. Yeah, absolutely. And next slide is this sort of very, packing it very densely where these terrace towers here allow them to free up uh, space for recreation in open spaces. There's also this artificial lake in this you know, very innovative community. And we will show you now in the next slide how beautiful it looked like from the very beginning, right, DeSoto? <laughs> well, actually, from the very beginning, and you can see this is it under construction. The construction cranes are still in the midst of all these buildings. And it actually looked pretty terrible at this <laughs> point because it's just concrete. It is a dense concrete complex and it looks very unappealing. It looks institutional. It doesn't look warm. It doesn't look inviting. But in fact, that was just the way it looked when it was constructed. And if you go to the next slide, we're going to see that it changed quite a bit through time because it's covered with greenery now. Now, as we have to point out, this is in a temperate climate. So during the winter, it's not as green because everything has lost its leaves. But during the summer, not only is there a lot of foliage at the bases of these towers, but there are these troughs which are filled with, and we're going to see in some cases, large mature trees that screen things, that green it up, that give you humidity, that give you more oxygen, and make the whole thing look a lot more inviting and a lot more livable. Mm -hmm. And why it looks like a jungleized kind of a sculpture enlarged, so like a formal approach, it was actually designed the opposite, which we're always recommending is the better way to go and gets us to the next slide, which is the inside out design approach, right? Yeah. And we're seeing here, uh, I screenshot that from a documentary on local TV from some years ago. And it's featuring um, one of the associated partners with Banish, the architect of record, uh, Fritz Auer, who grew up in this neighborhood because the architects were so convinced about it that they thought, I want to live in there, what I designed, which isn't always happening. But it shows that they're really, you know, were believing in what they were doing. And so the son basically decided to also stay there and raise his family. And he is, uh, however, privileged to have um, a ground floor unit within a large talking courtyard, our last theme for the last nine shows. So he has a courtyard. But you had a concern, right, that we were then discussing. Well, if the courtyard certainly looks really nice, but I thought you don't really have a lot of privacy in the courtyard because when you're down there, everybody in the building above you can look down at you. And in reality, you cleared that up for me the troughs which are used as planters are so wide that you cannot actually stand and look over the railing from your balcony. So in fact, you don't have people looking down on you and spying at you in your backyard or your courtyard. You have privacy as well as all of they, them have privacy in their balconies, not only from people looking up, but also from people next door to them looking from side to side. So it's a very successful design in terms of that, again, making it more livable and more appealing. Yeah. And going to the next slide, showing us more the sort of uh, representative uh, units, which all the stacked ones um, here, you can see, I pulled this from websites from some for sale or for rent. You can see there's a multitude of different situations. There's even a 
two-story one at the top right, you see that spiral staircase, different fenestrations, they're all pushed back. So they're not, you know, basically shaping the front of the building. They're in the back, so they're allowed as well. But um, next slide, certainly, which you had been, you know, already saying we want to talk about it. This is the most feature is how it got basically taken over by the natural environment who really kind of jungleized and nature is crawling over and invading the structure. And that reminded us of our friends from Killingsworth and Ron Lindgren and Larry Stricker. Here is Larry's Ihilani Hotel up there with a Carlos Denise rendering where he said we wanted to uh, Bougainville the whole thing and then it got value engineered and only the other, other floor ended up, but still it's a very prominent feature of the Killingsworth office. And next slide um, at the top right is uh, my most beloved detail of um, that parking garage slash gym part of the Ihilani, which shows the superb um, easy breezy space um, with uh, around the uh, structural expressionist uh, tectonics. And the fenestration is basically plantation is plants and is a is is a curtain. So ever since I saw that, I thought, wow, it's it actually you know it works. It is it it has happened. And Ihilani has been around since the early '90s. And then here, um, you know, the the German uh, architects basically have um, and you know, we use the term zeitgeist have been you know in the same zeitgeist doing this here. And this is what you were been talking about before. Look at that mature tree in the middle of that big picture here, right? Exactly. So these right. troughs are really big and can hold a lot of soil. So there isn't just little flowers growing in there. But as you pointed out, only in the summer, a few months a year, not so much anymore. And the next picture is going to show us what we're going to have next, most likely. <laughs> it's this white stuff that if I'm saying, you don't know, you might be offended and saying, yes, if I go up to the top of Mauna Kea, I have it, but that's pretty much it from yes. knowing it in a way, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, that might give you some chills, but also what might give you some chills are the little pictures at the top, right? Yeah, because those are real estate listings for these apartments, and we see that they do not rent for cheap. They are going for, as I remember, one to two to three thousand euros a month so that's comparable and even more than dollars and then in the upper right there's a little one for sale that's a studio that uh, you said was about 330 square feet and it's about well it's 249,000 euros so as you said it's up around 270,000 75,000 dollars so yeah the prices are not dissimilar to what we know in Honolulu. And as you said, to me, this is because it's a very desirable place to live. So the prices are high because people want to live there. And that shows you it's successful, but it also shows you that a certain segment of the population is shut out because it's expensive. Yeah. And that percentage of the population is growing, unfortunately. So they should be in the center of our attention of developments, new developments. And that gets us back to Hawaii. What might this all be good for? Next slide. Uh, for, you know, multi-story developments, here are cargo courtyards, cabana clustered, uh, that I did a show with, with Jay about, where, again, we stack cargo steel and shipping containers. Um, we, again, in the tropics, we should dwell and basically massage um, our easy breeziness because it allows us to be way more cost efficient uh, and effective. And the next slide, while you know, cargo steel is not for everyone, you know, we have other kind of post-contact uh, local construction methods as for example, precast concrete, right? Out there at Grace Pacific Rocky Mountain precast that in the top middle picture a quote of a show that you have been investigating and doing a phone interview with its architect, Bandit Kanistakan, and he's been using that method for its Moloili lofts. We've been doing it a lot. And then also on the island, there is the Kahala Apartments. And this is from the old, when the website of Alfred Yee's office was still up there. The Kahala Apartments were pretty much built the same way as we see at the, at the bottom there, where the whole Olympic Village pretty much has been prefabbed. 
So that was really innovative at, at its time. And it's still a very desirable construction methods that we should look more into because, um, next slide, uh, as you kindly um, uh, update me on what's going on on the island, but sometimes it's depressing me, which is not your fault, but the fault of people who are proposing this. And what are we looking at here? Well, we're looking at the plans potentially for what's going to happen to Ala Moana Center. And one thing, obviously, is the uh, train station, the terminus of the train line is going to be there. So that is spurring a lot of development there. But the, um, the current owners of Ala Moana, I believe, are seeing it less and less as a shopping center and more and more as a real estate venture in which they can build more high rises on that very now valuable piece of property that's very centrally located and is ripe for development. So they're proposing a bunch of towers be built in addition to what's already there, uh, that's the shopping center. And we are, I mean, we'll see how much of that actually happens and we'll see what these buildings end up looking like, but um, they don't look as though they're going to be particularly what we would prefer to see. And one of the things that particularly is, makes that noticeable is, Right in the middle of all of that is the Ala Moana building from 1961, which was an extremely innovative building for its time. It was from a time period in which innovation and technological advancement was really looked up to. And we're seeing the buildings being built around it as not taking advantage of that, not hearkening back to what was originally designed there, but just building a bunch of glass boxes, which are hermetic and are users of fossil fuels. And no indication of what even the Olympic Village did in the 70s in Munich in temperate climate, large lanai's. Here we see no lanai's, right? Yeah. And that's a shame. If Howard Hughes is doing that, it's bad enough. But then these people should learn and see, well, what can we do differently? And next slide, again, provided by you kindly, but again, making me depressed is it doesn't get better the more they reveal the details of their project. This one here also location-wise, you know, makes me sad because in this location, I used to be in my little favorite hole in the wall, Korean restaurant that has yummy things for decent money. And they're most likely not able to go back in because of the rent is going to be too high. And while this building is orientation wise, okay, it's running Malka Makai, but then fenestration wise, it's very much alike. If you look like the symphony that you see in the middle compared to the uh, provocative sunburn that lady ha here has because these buildings are doing the same thing and you've got to power against it with burning fossil fuel and as you pointed out it's even more tragic because you can see in this aerial view on the left you see the iconic Alamoana building you also see 1315 Alamoana Boulevard which is by Alfred Yee and Yamasaki as very very great biclimatic pioneers that did it all right half of a century ago, right? So next slide. Uh, we obviously wanna see a reconnection to that because again, here are, here's the legacy of that, of that site, right? It wasn't only John Graham, basically with the Alamoana building, probing and testing for the World Fair in Seattle with a equal similar rotating restaurant, right? But it was also uh, Alfred Yee again with the Alamoana Hotel that if you look it up was built just two years before the Olympic Village and can pride itself as having been the tallest structure, you know, at that time. So as you and your great show referencing at the bottom right, there's a tradition of innovation on the island and you want to evolve that, right? Yeah. And so next slide is, um, you know, suggestions to do that, we're looking at Primitiva One that we've been covering here and there. And the great Alfred Yee, before he then passed away, had a chance to look at us and cheerleaded us and said, you know, keep on going that way. And you were sitting next to who else who we see at the very top left ones in a review. Uh, we had Neil Abercrombie at, uh, at your uh, class in which we critiqued and or listened to the presentations of your emerging generation students. and. Um, I was present also along with him. And so I've gotten to see as you've gone through this, uh, what, what, you, what your students have come up with for these types of not only being innovative, but also dealing with things that we have to deal with now, not only in terms of costs, but livability and so on. 
and not another C is COVID, right? You pointed out easy breeziness is the way to go and to breathe easy. You want to be outside. We soon and right now starting can't do this anymore, but you can and you should in Hawaii. Right. And so the next slide was Primitiva 2 that tried to do that even more with a less territorialized nature of the units, but more be like a fluid cascading landscape that is more built upon what people do anyways on the beach and popping up their tent and have a more informal settlement, right? Why can't we adopt that in, in housing as well? And uh, the last slide we want to show, uh, because we're launching Primitiva 3 in the spring, and it's basically the great um, structural um, conceptualist of the Olympic uh, Games part with a gigantic tent structure we were talking about. Fry Otto is, a, is an informal mentor of that project. And we're just like Tarzan and Jane, you know, have been using tensile structures to move through the jungle. We're looking at if a tower couldn't or shouldn't do that as well. So. Right. Uh, obviously, stay tuned for that. We will keep you updated on that one. So with that, uh, thank you for that half an hour of taking me back to paradise and your birds. And at one point, the breeze was so strong, we couldn't hear you anymore. That's right. And the dog has decided to stay on the comfy side today. So uh, treasure the tropics and uh, see you next time again, DeSoto and everyone else. Aloha. Bye -bye.